So, welcome back for the last little bit. We'll be a little abbreviated today as we kind of clear the room for another class that needs to come in. We've been talking about Revit spaces and how we can use them using space separators and setting the occupancy and setting the schedule, which is really nice in terms of creating uh, some information about the loads and the number of people and things like that. I'm going to show you just a couple of last tricks in terms of working the spaces so that we can uh, just kind of uh, make all those uh, floor plans that include the spaces really sing in terms of getting the information you want. Okay, we can go through and add things up. We can add up the areas, same sort of things that we normally do with schedules. Let me show you a couple floor plan tricks that are actually sort of useful. As you're thinking about your floor plans, one thing we often do to our floor plans is to sort of make them a little more representative and communicative of what's going on is we add an annotation to them called the color fill. And color fills we have often been doing by rooms and room names. Okay, let's go ahead and annotate here. We'll do the color fill. Drop it on in there. So again, where that is is under annotate. Color fill is uh, one of the different options of the tool, color fill legend. We can put one in here. And it can say, would you want to do it based on zones, rooms, or spaces? We're going to choose spaces. We only have a single scheme defined right now, or schema. We'll say OK to that. But we'll edit that. Currently, all the spaces, all the space, that's any space at all, is color color coded green. If you'd like to change that around a little bit, you can go through and edit that. If you choose the um, legend and say edit the schema, what you can do is actually choose which field you want to use to do the distinction. So we can, for example, go through and distinguish not by name, but we can distinguish by space type. And that would be good just in terms of being able to see the different types of space types very easily. It's going to say, warn me, it's going to change the colors. So now I can see that I have, oh, the blue color, the green color, and the gray color, based upon the different types of offices that are there. If you wanted to, you could also go through and distinguish based on a number. So for example, in here, I can say edit the scheme. And as opposed to doing it by space type, we could do it for something like number of people. Now, number of people is interesting in, from the standpoint of, if I say by range, basically everything up to 50 is kind of interesting to me. Everything above 50 is interesting to me because that's how I know which rooms have a single door, or which rooms have double doors, or have triple doors. So I can go through and distinguish them that way too. Okay, and in this case, it looks like the two office areas aren't so bad, but the big blue area up there has 50 or more, so it's going to need some additional exits to it. Okay, so just different little things that you can use to just really get a little more information out of your model to help you sort of do some planning. Okay, one other thing we'll show you how to do that's just sort of useful on the floor plan is, you see this lowly old tag, our space tag which you loaded from the library, it has the area, it has the volume, something like that in it. If you would like to add a little more information to it, you can do that. So you can choose that tag and there's different types of tags, but something we don't do very often is edit the tag. And if we edit the tag, we can choose to add whatever fields and information we want. And really, Revit's a big database of information. Let's kind of take a look at what we can add. If you say edit it, we will say, okay, here are the existing fields. There's the name, the number, there's two fields, one on top of each other here. One's the square footage and one's the volume. Let me zoom that out a little bit. If I would like to add another field, what I can do is go to create. I will say, let's go ahead and create a label. And I'm going to choose what I'd like to display. So if I'd like to display, for example, the space type, I can put that in there. If I could want to display the number of people, I can display that. Just really whatever information it is that you're sort of interested. I'll put a break in between those two. And now that's a piece of information that's available through the tag. I'll just center it down here. Maybe make it a little smaller. And if I load that back into my project,
you'll see now I have that information just being very visible to me. So I can sort of see it's a classroom, here's the load, here's the open office, here's all these different things we can go through and like figure out, hmm, only six people over there in the enclosed offices, only four people over there. But the nice thing is now as you go through and adjust, you can see that as you move the walls around, the number of people changes automatically. You can really start to see the effect of your design decisions on really what ultimately is going to be the driving requirements. So, pretty cool that way. Yes? Is there a way to kind of easily replace the space upgrade with a different wall? Like, you know, like, maybe you could do that. Yes. Well, actually, it's just, as soon as you draw a wall, you know, so as soon as you, if you're getting to that level, you go through and put a wall in there. Okay, and then what I do is go back and grab the space separator. Just get rid of it. So there's not a swap. There's not a select and swap. Um, I used to use the separator to yeah. find the space. And then every time when I tried to put a wall in, and then I'll need to remember to delete the separator. Yeah, there's not a, we can use the room separator, the space separator, the room separator to sort of place the wall, but it won't swap it out. So it'll, in fact, give you a little warning saying there are two things that run on top of each other that have the same equivalent function. Yeah, no, there's not. I wish. Hmm. So I'll think about that one. Okay. As we're clearing out for today, let's just kind of think a little bit about the whole notion of, as you think about a building like this, oh, doors, windows, all that kind of stuff, uh, where the corridors may be, and I'll just draw some stuff really quickly to kind of think about this. Yeah. If, for example, I'm thinking about a corridor coming down this hallway, okay, and maybe on this side there's just a single corridor down here. Okay, so let's think about where exits are. As you're coming on down this hallway, you're thinking about the rooms on each side, this side and that side. Do you think it's a good idea to put a uh, doorway right there, or is one necessary, or wh what you're thinking about whether a doorway should go there? Should there be a doorway here when you come down the corridor, or is it okay just to have it sort of be like a dead end? Okay. I think that should be a doorway. It's, it's one of those things, it probably does make sense to put some sort of doorway down in here. Okay, probably opening out like that. Okay, um, it doesn't have to be, it really depends on what the distance is between here and where the nearest exit is in terms of what goes on. But it's often a good idea to go through and put that in there just so that if there was a fire here, for example, if people were in these rooms, they could exit without having to go past the hazard. So in general, that kind of makes sense. Same thing down here. This is all cool in terms of what's going on, but it'd be nice to have a doorway either down here or another very common arrangement that you might get into is something like this, where there's a bigger room on the end, at which point the doorway is probably right here instead. Something like that coming off the hallway there. So it's nice not to have dead-ended hallways, is kind of the point of all that. If this were all kind of a big open space and we don't sort of worry so much, we just need to have exits at different points if it requires two doors or three doors, typically we won't put them right next to each other. We'll sort of split them away in the way that sort of makes sense. So it might make sense to put a doorway here, put a doorway here, and I might have that be the entrance to my building, something like that. But you always got to think about wherever you are, you want to be able to see the other doorway and have this alternate path to kind of get around. Okay, but we're going to go ahead and come up with a little exercise that involves a bunch of little building shapes and. You get to go ahead and put doorways in and figure out where you think the best places to be able to talk about you know, where you might have them. There's no precise science to it. There's rules that have to be met, but there's no precise science to it. Okay, so there's that. Other than that, when you start thinking about, oh, cores and all sorts of things like that, often lobby spaces like this are a place where cores or central services tend to get consolidated. So we'll talk more about the core just next time, but 
This whole zone in here is very sort of interesting me because once you're in that lobby, whether I'm going to get to an elevator or get to a stairway or get to the restrooms, all those things, you know, it tends to be convenient to put them there as opposed to having to go wandering halfway around the building to find something. But if we do, for example, have a stairway coming up to the second floor right here, chances are we're going to have to put a couple different stairways in. So a very common condition you'll get into is, oh, even like right over here at the end of this hallway, yeah, we may end up having a stairway right here where the door's still down here at the end. At the first floor, you go straight out. The second floor, you go down the stairs and go out. Okay, that's sort of very common condition for doing stuff like that. Over here, real life stairways can be on the inside as well as on the outside. They don't have to be on the inside of the building. If it's really just a fire stair and it's about escaping, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be conditioned in a fantastic space. It's really only going to be used in the, uh, the emergency stuff like that. I'll save the whole discussion of restrooms and sizes and all that stuff to next time. But in general, what I'm going to keep encouraging you to do, and we'll talk about this when we meet individually, just try to you know, consolidate that space. The more compact and together it is, the better. If there's a restroom way over here, and a restroom way over there, and one over here, it just it means your utilities are going to be sort of strung out in a funny way. Same thing with your mechanical room. We'll talk about how they go to need to be. But in general, if we have a space where there's some mechanical equipment, if it's centrally located, the distance to the farthest point will be less. So it'll be a little more efficient. The size will be better. If you put it way down here on the end, the problem is it's a long way to get to over here. So there's a lot of inefficiency and probably very large ducts to do that. So that's why you know, when we say core, it almost always it's like the spinal column. Everything kind of comes together and hangs off it. Okay, But we'll talk about the specifics of that next time. So we can let our sensing friends come on in. Okay, so be on the lookout for a message about signing up for some times to come see us. And in between now and then, just get your ideas together and for meeting with us as well as to put them in the journal. Okay, beauty.